good afternoon everyone and uh, thanks for joining us today uh, for uh, you know webinar on the most talked about technology today uh, generative ai and uh, you know this is brought to you by cmr and our partner bt and bt um, i am anil chopra vp cmr cmr and uh, research editor for cyber media group of publications and i'll be hosting today's session uh, now before we proceed further just note that uh, you know for the duration of this webinar all the lines will be in listen only mode and if you have any questions you can post them in the chat window or in the Q&A window that will be there in front of you. Um, we'll do a Q&A at the end of today's session. Uh, now, today's session is, you know, specifically on how you can actually unlock the power of generative AI. Now, while the technology itself is hot, but one common question I keep getting, you know, from a lot of CIOs whom I have spoken to in the past couple of months is around uh, the application of generative AI or, you know, how do you really apply it to a business? Now, you know, while there are technologies, uh, you know, Gen AI based technologies like uh, chat GPT that are becoming very popular, but uh, there's another common challenge, uh, you know, how do you really practically apply it? And moreover, there are, you know, IP and copyright related issues uh, in using chat GPT so that, you know, how can we really trust uh, Gen AI technology and all the LLMs with the enterprise data that we're going to have in the organization? Um, but despite all that, you know, there's still a lot of interest around, uh, you know, uh, Gen AI. And um, in fact, uh, CMR did a recent survey, uh, you know, we did our annual IT priority study in which we reached out to 400 uh, IT decision makers. And we found that, you know, uh, Gen AI, of course, is, you know, uh, relevant and of interest to most people, but it plays a very significant role in the development of, you know, customer centric products or for data driven decision making or for, you know, improving the customer service. Um, we found that, you know, majority of the respondents kind of chose these three areas as, you know, where they'd like to really look at how they can use, uh, you know, uh, Gen AI uh, in their organization. So, you know, that's why this uh, webinar today, a lot of interaction has shown us a lot of interest, plus our surveys also indicate, uh, you know, interest and in specific areas. And uh, to answer some of these, you know, we have a very special expert with us today and uh, he's going to address, uh, you know, most of your concerns around uh, Gen AI and talk about how do you really unlock, <laughs> excuse me, the power of uh, Gen AI for your business. Uh, you know, some of the things that we are going to cover is, uh, you know, include some of the foundation models and LLM, and you know the types of Gen AI with some examples and how do you really boost productivity with this technology how do you customize the AI models to specific business needs and risks and benefits and of course the IP related issues and how do you really safeguard your data to ensure you know and ensure ethical employee use um, you know and some of the cost implications so um, you know these are some of the things we'll cover today and uh, you know to do that it's my real pleasure to invite uh, and introduce our speaker today uh, V. Srinivas Rao He's the chairman and MD of BT and BT, uh, also fondly called, uh, you know, known as VSR. So, um, can we have VSR on the screen? Hi, VSR. Welcome Hi. and thanks for joining us today. And before I hand over, you know, the controls to you, I'll just give me a few minute, one minute or so to, you know, share your brief profile with our attendees today. So. Sure. Uh, VSR has 26 years of, you know, diverse experience in the IT industry and has worked in senior executive positions at uh, Indian IT majors like TCS, Infosys, iGate, Satyam, uh, you know, uh, and last one being the CDO of Tech Mahindra. He's a business leader. He's a renowned speaker, author, and, uh, you know, social entrepreneur. Uh, he's also authored a book named Lean Digital Thinking, um, you know, which is available on Amazon Kindle. And uh, currently, he's the Chief Digital Officer and Consultant and Advisor at BT and BT. So welcome again, VSR, and uh, I'll hand over the controls to you. So please take it from here. Thank you so much, Anil. Uh, thanks for that uh, brief introduction. I'm sure I think uh, for the last 12 months uh, after Chart GPT, everybody is uh, talking about uh, what is this generative AA, AA and all, right? So till that time, okay, artificial intelligence was there, but after Chat GPT was introduced uh, in November 2022, so a lot of uh, hype and also a lot of uh, reality exists. 
So what I'm going to do in the next probably 45 minutes is uh, uh, introducing uh, generative AI in my point of view. It's not like uh, the audience who joined here doesn't know about it, but uh, it's always uh, we will have our experience sharing and our viewpoints. So even the participants uh, can ask questions, challenge, so we can have a discussion. So with that note, uh, let me immediately start uh, my session. So this is something, uh, let me share my PPT. Yeah, I hope uh, it is uh, visible to everyone. Yes, it's visible here, VSR. Okay, great. Okay, so I think there's a lot of jargon is introduced in the last 12 months, okay? So let me try to give my understanding of what is this generative AI. Then there are some foundation models, large language models. So they are interchangeably used, whether the foundation models and LLMs are same or they're different. So that's what I think in my first part of my discussion. So I would like to share my thought process. Okay, so what is generative AI? It is, of course, an artificial intelligence. This is one form of artificial intelligence. It learns from the existing data. The data could be the text or audio or video, um, or images, whatever. It learns from that. And then it creates a very new, which looks like the original content. Again, in the form of text, images, music, software code. Even it can give you some design concepts. Maybe the skeletal outline of the design concepts, it could be uh, for a chemical or it is a molecular structure and all those things. It's not just simply generative AI limiting to text images, music, audio, video and all. Generative AI is slowly getting into the product design concepts and also the 3D modeling concepts and all. I'm saying concepts, so we will we'll discuss that further. So it is essentially a smart tool that transforms the learned information into novel outputs. I think that's what the generative AI. Generative means it is generating. What is that it is generating? It is generating content. It could be text, images, music, software code, or design concepts, okay? So that's, I think, uh, a brief uh, overview of generative AI. There are two models which everybody is talking about today under this generative AI. One is foundational model, and second one is large language model. Is there any difference? It is very important for us to understand. Okay. Yes, certainly there is a lot of difference between foundation model, a large language model. A large language model can be a foundation model. It may be a specifically trained model derived from the foundation model. Okay. But vice versa, it is not true. So let us look at what is that foundation model. Generally, it is considered as a broader and more versatile. It is pre-trained on wider range of data modalities. That means it is trained on text, it is trained on code or images or videos, audios and all. Okay. But if it comes to the large language models, it is mainly language, the text. It's not images or it is not videos or audios or uh, something like that, right? So I think... So the foundation models and large language models, the fundamental difference is the data modalities on which the data, on which type of data it is tried and what type of outputs these foundation models will give, what tasks they perform. Based on that, you can really say, this is a foundation model, this is a large language model. So let me give you a little bit more details here. If you want to say whether it is a foundation model or a large language model, you have to see how many tasks these models are able to perform. Look at here. There are, I think, almost 10 tasks are there. Okay, natural language understanding, natural language generation. That's one task being performed by these models. Then machine translation. I'll explain everything in the next slide. Text summarization, question answering, creative content creation, code generation, material properties prediction, scientific discovery, robotics and automation, cybersecurity and fraud detection. If you take this as a checklist, so which tasks are performed by foundational model, which tasks are performed by 
the large language models, if you really differentiate, then you can easily understand that. So look at here. So just to give again an idea of each task, interpreting the human language and generating response to that is NLU and NLG, then machine translations, translating from Telugu to English, English to Hindi, Hindi to Telugu or French or whatever. It is a translation of languages. Then summarizing a PDF document is there that you can summarize and give or a large article is there. Then you can summarize and have the demystified version of that. That is a text summarization. Then you can ask a question. You can get an answer. Then you can create the creative uh, content like articles, artworks, social media players, or music, all those things. And code generation, software code. A very interesting look at here, material properties prediction. That means the models are trained on so many material properties like conductivity, strength, thermal resistance and all. But you will give a requirement, I want to have a material which is very lightweight and which will have the high heat resistance and all. Can you give me new and which really very unique properties? Then the, land, the model can give you a something, a, a material which has those properties which you are looking for. Okay. Then scientific discovery, learning from existing chemical structures, especially in the drug and pharma industry. And the models are trained with the past molecule structures and the combination of the chemicals and all. Then you can ask if I want to have this sort of a drug, what could be the potential structural element of those particular drug in the molecules and all. So that is a scientific discovery. Then robots and automation. So if you want to train the robots and automation today, getting the um, real data might be difficult. Then there is a synthetic data you can generate and you can train it. The robotics also can respond again the text or it can give the images or it can show you the videos. So anything, it can be used in the retail industry or our hospitality industry and all. Then the cybersecurity and fraud detection also possible. So with this to summarize, so if you see here the left side, these are all the tasks being performed by the models. If all these tasks are performed, I call it as a foundation model. And if it's only limited to, I think, till the code generation, maybe the large language models doesn't have the abilities for the material properties prediction, scientific discoveries, robotic and automation, and cybersecurity and fraud detection. So those things, mostly they are focused on content and humanly given natural language understanding, generation, so on and so forth. That is called large language model. Okay. So um, in the interest of the time, I don't want to read everything, but to give you an idea how these models basically are run. That means like human brain, how your human neurons are connected. I'm sure you know that our brain has 86 billion neurons and 100 trillion co connections. That's the biggest brain. So like that, there are very smaller scale, maybe a nano scale. You cannot compare even with our human brain. So these are all the brains for these models. The generative adversarial networks, variational auto encoders, transformer models, uh, so on and so forth. That means these algorithmic models are going to play very vital role in the foundation models and also the large language models. These are trained. Like when you are born, your brain doesn't have the great capability. But when you are started learning, the connections are established, your brain is becoming stronger and stronger and having more knowledge injected into your brain. Similarly, these are all the brains for these models. After training and training and learning, they also become very powerful. So this is very important. These are all the few examples what sort of algorithmic models are used. I don't think uh, from business perspective, we need to understand and learn all these things. But technology guys probably need to understand which algorithmic model architecture is useful for which business scenario. All right. Then many people are asking, what is the difference between traditional AI and generative AI? Very interesting. Look at here. So traditional AI, mostly analyzing the existing data, understanding the existing data. Based on that, it will give the patterns, predictions, and all. Generative AI create new data. It could be text, it could be audio, it could be video, it could be image, it could be material, properties, so on and so forth. All right. Data handling, traditionally mostly structured. It's not like uh, it doesn't support unstructured. It's mostly structured, but it is diverse, the generative AI. 
Then model types, we already discussed some of these brains, which I already spoke about. The brain here is different from the brain there. Of course, if you look at the scientists, how their brains are built is different. If you look at a technology professional, how their brains are different. Similarly, the traditional AI models and generative AI models, the type of the architectural or algorithmic models are different. So applications, I, this is uh, traditional AI for mostly classification, prediction, analysis. If you look at generative AI, it is for content creation, content or data augmentation and all. Training approach, mostly supervised, unsupervised. But here it is more of when you go through the content, when it is tried, it will understand, it will learn the patterns, connections between the uh, languages, connection between the words, all those things, the learning distributions patterns will be there. Use cases, mostly spam. These are all very simple use cases. Of course, a lot of other things will be there. Traditional AI is mostly deterministic, but generative AI is mostly probabilistic. Okay. So this is the difference. So any questions still now? I think, uh, you know, if there's any questions, then just you can uh, type them in the chat window or in the Q&A uh, icon on your screen. And yeah. so that we can just take those questions, uh, you know, either in between or maybe at the end of the session. Yeah, I, I want to see if anything, any, anything in the mid middle of uh, the session is okay. So yeah. that's what I think. Uh, I want to set the context. I think what is generative AI and what are the foundation models and the large language models. Uh, these models perform almost 10 tasks. Based on the tasks they perform, we call it as a foundation model or a large language model. And the brains on which these models are built to have that clearly explained. And now traditional AI and generative AI, what is the difference? I think that's very important for us to understand. Now, let us look at what are the different types of this generative AI, which is very interesting. Look at here. So uh, Gartner has come up with something like in the generative AI. So there is a same mode generative AI, cross model generative AI, multi-model generative AI. That means generative uh, generates the data in the same mode. If you give the text, it gives the text. If you give the image, it gives the image. That is same mode generator. So cross model means if you give the text, it will give a video. If you give the text, it may give you image. Okay, that means it is a cross model. Then multi-model generated way means understands and generate the contents. Maybe it is a mix of, uh, if you give a text, you may ask, I want an audio, video, and a, a beautiful scenic background and all. Of course, still, it is not that mature. It is evolving. Okay. So Google has been spending a lot of uh, uh, money on the multi-model generated way. So I think this is what the Gartner has uh, classified. What are the different categories of A? Okay. Now, let us look at what are the types. So some generative models only generate the text generation, image generation, audio generation, video generation, and 3D models. Then generate way for design, which I'll explain. Language translations. Then data synthesis. Today, getting the data is very difficult. Privacy issues. The data may not be having the required quality. Then how do you simulate the data which is very nearer to the realistic data? That's where the data synthesis AI is becoming very, very critical in the healthcare industry or any other industry. Getting data to train the models is becoming a big challenge. Then how you synthesize that, how you create it, which looks real, okay? But it is not going to compromise the privacy, right? So next is code generation AI and then material properties generation AI. So these are all the different types of generative AI uh, uh, exist. Look at here again, in the previous uh, slide, I discussed about tasks being performed. And in the horizontal, I have given generative AI types. So this is a two dimensional matrix. That means which AI model or a type will perform which tasks. If you look at text generation AI, yes, NLU, natural language understanding and generation, machine translation, text summarization, question answering, robotic and automation here means the robot is a device like a laptop, like a mobile device. How, how you are able to use a uh, sort of uh, chart GPT or a BARD type of uh, um, tasks you are able to perform. The robot perform the similar tasks. That's where the robot automation also added here. Okay. Then image generation, it generates the 
um, creative content, robotics and automation, like that. Uh, you have you look at here generative AI for code, then code generation task it will perform. It also it will create a, a, a testing code uh, to find the security vulnerabilities within the code. So that's where the generative AI for code is not only for code, it also generates the test scripts, it also generates the code required to strengthen the security within the software code. So that is another task and all. Then, so I think this, this is very important for all of us to understand what tasks are being performed by generative AI and which type of generative AI will perform which tasks actually. Okay, a few examples here, look at here, text generation, you have Google Bard and you have Chart GPT today. And image generation AI, you have Depart, DALI by OpenAI, then audio generation AI, Google's WaveNet, and uh, OpenAI's Jukebox. Video generation, you have Deepfakes, and uh, Synthentia is an excellent tool. You can give the text to generate video, even runway, right? Deepfakes are mostly run, uh, done by these video generation AIs. And then uh, generative AI for 3D modeling. So look at here, these models basically what they do. So they take the inputs like uh, uh, what are the geometries and uh, designs like factors like material usage, strength, uh, aesthetics. You give those inputs like image is generated, automatically 3D models are generated like Autodesk uh, Dreamcatcher. Then generative AI for design, you look at here and you give a specific requirements. Okay, I want a material which weighs less, which has this much of strength. And I want the material must be manufactured in this method. And I also want a very affordable material. You ask that question, then Autodesk Generative Design Technology might give you a properties of the material which probably might meet your requirement. This is also a generative AI outcome. The language translation, you can go, uh, Google Translate is there. If any language to any language, it will basically um, translate, okay? So data synthesis, you look at mostly AI. That's another very interesting tool, mostly AI, which will give you uh, synthetic data. That means an artificial data, which is uh, nearer to the real data so that you can use it for testing software. So you can use it for testing some sort of uh, um, any other uh, related uh, uh, algorithmic models to train them if data is not available. Code generation, you have Copilot, GitHub, Codex, Kite and all, they it generate the code. Another interesting thing you look at here, in silico medicine or atom wise, these are all the generative AI tools. They will also give you the material properties what you are asking for, okay? So these are all a few examples. So, but anyhow, I don't think I have tested all, but few things I have extensively used. But for you to understand, uh, I have given the list of different types, generative AI types and what sort of examples are there and tools are being used today. So what is the message I would like to give here is, most of the people think that the generative AI is for like something like a chart GPT or a BARD. I think that's wrong. There are so many different tools are there, which is beyond text images, right? If you really look at, they are used for scientific discoveries, uh, material properties, and synthetic data is created. It is used for code and so on and so forth. All right, so I think this is the second part of my discussion. The third part, when you yes, are... Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, sorry to interrupt. I think before we move to the third part, there are some questions that people have posted. Maybe you want to just take them now or do you want to yeah. take them towards the end? Go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, 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 someone was asking about an example of for each, but I think you've already given plenty of examples of using uh, chat GPT or generative AI, so I'm not going to get into that. But in case, um, you know, the person who asked the question has any further, more specific question, then please post that. Second question is that um, if we go for 3P services in developing Gen AI outcomes, you know, multimodal, then how do we understand what Gen AI types are covered? Oh, so sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, so it's in the Q&A in front of you. You can just open that also. It's by Sanjay. So, uh, you know, it's about if we go for 3P services and developing Gen AI outcomes, how do we understand what Gen AI types are covered? What is 3P services? I mean, Sanjay, is, maybe you is... want to just uh, give a clarity on that? 
and somebody says please let me know any details of agi okay so this is a confusion generative ai is different from agi artificial general intelligence is entirely that is a traditional ai that means when uh, uh, the ai can perform near human intelligent focused activities maybe a little bit of consciousness a little bit of emotions also injected okay so when it is equivalent to or near equivalent to human intelligence that is called artificial general ai and i think it might take in my view 25 years to 20 to 25 years from now to reach the artificial general intelligence to still today we are in the narrow artificial intelligence and if you want to go to super ai it might take another 50 to 60 or 100 years where the ai is more powerful than human beings that is singularity generative ai is still not agi artificial general intelligence it is still uh, narrow artificial intelligence okay yeah, I hope that answers the question. Uh, you know, the, the on 3P, uh, Sanjay is basically saying that, you know, third party. So if we uh -huh. go for any third party services in developing Gen AI, uh -huh. uh, how do we really understand what Gen AI types are really being covered there? Is there a way yeah, to do that? Whenever you try in a model, right? That's why I'm going to explain that. How you uh, deploy, develop and all, give me some time. If I don't answer at the time, I think then I think he can put the question, right? So I will explain okay. that. Okay. So uh, I'm getting a lot of questions. People are asking a lot of questions. So do you yeah. want to continue with the presentation and then take them? Uh, and then I think uh, let the flow continue because two parts we covered and uh, quickly we'll complete this and we can get into the questions. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. Then most importantly, I think generative AI is not just for the sake of uh, training the models and using it for like chat GPT gives me a beautiful article, blog or content or something. But how it will be useful for improving the productivity in the business? How it will be useful to improve the operational excellence? And can it bring the competitive advantage? So that's where I think it is very important. It is still in the nascent stage. A lot of organizations started using the generative AI for boosting their productivity, operational excellence, and competitive advantage. Let me share a few of my thoughts here. So when we talk about uh, these definitions, let, let us also be in sync. So productivity, that means the volume of output, you get it relative to input. That means with the less out input, I can get more output and all the productivity can generate way improves that. Okay, with less work, can I get more, right? Efficiency, how economically you are using the resources, right? are the inputs what you are using for the production of something. Then the cycle time, the total time taken to complete business process from start to end, Error rate, how frequently you are getting the defects or errors in our business in different areas, customer satisfaction, cost reduction, and competitive advantage, how your capabilities differentiate from the others. So looking at these things, I have tried to give a few examples. How generative AI can improve the productivity, improve the operational excellence, and also brings you some competitive advantage. Okay. So look at here, a few things like uh, productivity. Today, GitHub and even the chat GPT type of uh, tools are able to give uh, code, right? Don't it? Can somebody put on the mute, please? Hello? Please put on mute, please. Anil? Hello, yeah. So, uh, productivity, if you look at the customizer software solutions, okay, GitHub Copilot is there, even Charge GPT gives you good code, right? And some of the, I think, uh, the educational training tools are using the generative AI. They can generate the content relevant to a particular student, the pace of learning. And uh, the quiz, if they address how many marks they are getting and all, the generative AI tool can understand and uh, structure the content, the sequence of the content. So those are all possible. Then banking, Morgan Stanley is using some of these algorithms like uh, BET and uh, GPT-4, GPT-3, 
So we don't know much details. This is an internet search. So some of the areas probably might challenge me because I have not gone to Morgan Stanley and checked there. So they are able to now try to see that a particular customer perspective, if they understand the customer persona or not, uh, relevant to that customer, how they can get the information, okay, using generative AI. It could be financial data or any other related information, right? So certainly the productivity perspective, generative AI plays a very vital role. Then efficiency. So how you can design and develop a product. It's not like the traditional way. And today Autodesk type of tools are able to give you the product concepts pretty faster and with less resources. And you can also, you don't need to do the prototyping in the soft flow. You can do prototyping using these tools. So the efficiency is going up, okay? Then healthcare, as I mentioned, so it is too hard to get the test data, training data, especially in the healthcare scenarios. So synthetic medical data generation, that is MD clone, that is the tool which being used to generate the synthetic medical data uh, for uh, the uh, for the testing and the training of the models. Automotive, this is again concept, not at confirmed. BMW, we understand that they are using DALI, AutoML, and uh, for generating the concepts design, okay? They might be in architectural components, it could be an image, or it could be two-dimensional image. So how, uh, yesterday I tried in dal -E. you can draw it on a paper with some, I mean, I just draw one word with my pen on a white paper. I took it and I took the photograph in the dal -E, and I asked it, please draw it as per the input I have given. It has given a beautiful photo. So that means you can design something very innovative on a paper, just a configuration of the car, and ask the dal -E to give me Based on my inputs on this, can you give me some sort of a, an image or something? It automatically gives you. Then the cycle time, I, I mean, Autodesk, I'll, I already talked about it. If you want to generate video, look at, I mean, how much time the people take today. But today, if you give the good script, still they are coming up. An excellent video will come out when you give the test script. Okay. So you can simply pro 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 produce an excellent videos. Then Stitch Fix. This is again another generative AI tool. So it will basically help you to come up with your uh, configuration, your body configuration. And then what is that? I think fit it to you very well. The visual thing, then it will automatically give you what is the best uh, type of attire you can have. Then all these error rate you can reduce. And one interesting tool, compliance.ai. It is now a very interesting tool. I just uh, look at it in the internet. Wherever there is a change in the regulatory or any compliance related things in our banking or some other areas, it automatically gives you some sort of a standard operating procedures or a procedure how that compliance looks like. It's like a, a, a new process is defined and all. So these sort of compliance documents, it automatically generated whenever there is a change in the regulatory or compliance related uh, things from the government and other things. Otherwise, it is a too much of a work for you to go to check and then translate and do it, but anyhow, you cannot 100% depend on these tools. Manually also, you have to check, you have to look at these tools as a productivity enhancers, they reduce the cycle time, but most of the times, you have to be careful, the quality of outcome may be at, at, as you expected, or maybe sometimes wrong. That's why you cannot avoid the human interventions. More and more, you become a validator, you become a reviewer of the outputs generated by these tools. Okay, so like this, you have uh, so many tools uh, uh, in customer satisfaction, then uh, cost reduction. Music is produced today. I just tried one tool. It simply produced, I give the text, and the text is automatically translated to audio, and I can clone my voice today with generative AI tools. I will just speak, and it will train. It will be trained with my voice. It will be trained with my voice. Then automatically later, if I give the test script, it speaks as if VSR is speaking. And remember, a few years back, if you want to have a voiceover, I have to pay a lot of money. Today, there are so many generative AI tools are there. It's very easy to get the voiceover from the voice of the best-in-class uh, voiceover dubbing people, right? 
So a lot of, I think, cost is getting reduced because of this to generate way. the content, what to be generated in the education and training perspective. You can generate the question papers, whether it is a multiple choice questions, whether it is a fill in the blank questions or all, fraction of minutes, seconds also, right? Even chart GPT, you can try that, okay? But here specifically, there is one example, CAE Healthcare, okay? Then, so like this, I try to give a few examples so in the areas of productivity, efficiency, cycle time, error rate, customer satisfaction, cost reduction, competitive advantage and all. But one caution, you need to really check and you need to have the team and they have to go through every tool. You have to subscribe. Some of the things are free, but some of the things, if you want to get into the real features of all these tools, you have to subscribe for probably a year or a month or two or three, whatever the pricing model they have given experiment it as per your uh, business requirements and then see that how you can really use them for productivity or cost reduction or um, customer satisfaction and so on and so forth okay so this is another uh, important area okay this is another slide i have gathered from internet there are 101 use cases are given from this site research dot uh, a multiple a, a multiple dot com but we have to really check how many of these things are real? How many are only the list? But this is only to give you and uh, provoke you and uh, make you think. There are so many possibilities are there in the generative applications. Like Anil mentioned, I have taken this slide from Gartner. Today, most of the businesses are looking for generative AI in the areas of customer experience and retention, that is 38%. Revenue growth, 26%. Cost optimization, 17%. I think if you look at these are all the three uh, prioritized areas where Gartner predicted based on their surveys and all uh, where the customers are looking for. Okay, with this now, till now you have seen most of the models, whether foundation models or large language models which are available off the shelf and some of the things are built by organizations themselves. Okay. Now, let us understand if you want to customize already existing AI models for your specific business needs. Let us take Writesonic, Synthentia, ChatGPT, Bard. Okay, all these things are pre built. They might open some APIs, you might use them and all. But is it sufficient? Are they sufficient to meet our specific business needs? Okay, may not be, maybe. That means you cannot live when you want to really have differentiation with the existing AI models because that is available to everyone. So is it possible to customize them? That's what I'm going to speak sometime here. So the key question by IBM, when I saw one video, one of the speakers was asking, do you want to be a user of these uh, generative AI models or you want to be a value creator? Certainly if you are in a business, it's not just user, you also need to ensure you create the value. That's where I talk about the productivity improvement, cost reduction, customer uh, satisfaction, revenue generation. All those things are nothing but the value creators. But the off-the-shelf, the existing models help you to create that value, to help you to create the uh, differentiation, you have to really look at. If not, then you have to certainly look for customizations. Okay, another a few considerations for your information. A single model doesn't meet all your requirements. That means what? You will have the portfolio of generative AI models. Maybe it could be GPT-4, it could be uh, POM uh, from Google, or it could be something else. You built it from ground up, which doesn't exist in the market. You yourself built it. So it is like in the past, you have the API catalog. You also will have... Uh, as an organization, you have to maintain the generative AI model catalog, which may be open source, which may be commercially available, which may be built by yourself. So all these three combined, there must be an internal portal available for your organization employees to know that in my organization, these are all the portfolio of generative AI models are available and use it for this particular purpose. And uh, might have already integrated with the existing applications or use it for building the new applications and so on and so forth, okay? So the, with this, so how you customize? Okay, there are so many generative AI models are available. Okay, GPT-4 is there. 
The difference between GPT-4 and ChatGPT, I want to emphasize here. GPT-4 is a large language model. ChatGPT is an application built on GPT-4. ChatGPT itself is not a large language model. It is an application built on GPT-4. Now I want to ask a question. Can you build an equivalent chart GPT for your domain like healthcare, your domain for mining and all using chart GPT-4? Is it possible? Yes, it is possible. That's where I'm calling it as a custom generative AI models. That means there are already existing models available, GPT-4 or BARD or other models are available. They may be something from IBM, Watson X. Okay, then how do you ensure those models you train with your own data, with your own employees' data, business data, financial data, which is very sensitive and uh, confidential, so that that model start behaving the way you want to have the value, right? So that's why I think it is very important. What you do now in this, the, this is the life cycle. When we all started the career, we used to learn software development life cycle. You also have now the generative AI model development life cycle. First, you have to understand what is that data aggregation you have to do from public sources and uh, from your internal sources or from third party people. So how, what data you want to have is the first important thing based on whatever objective purpose you want to build the generative AI model. Then the model architecture selection, you want to select the existing uh, uh, available models. There are 4 lakh 12,000 models are available on Hugging Face. You don't need to worry about building it from ground. Okay. First, you have to ensure what model architecture and model is required. So you have to select them from the off the shelf in the marketplaces available. There are different marketplaces are available. So after the data is aggregated, go and select the model architecture and model. Then using some tools which are provided by the providers. So you tokenize the data. Okay. And then you train the model which you selected with the data. Then you validate whether this model is working as per the expected uh, performance. Okay, that's enough. No. Once you validate it, you tune that model for your own requirements, for your organization specific requirements. Okay. So that means maybe further specific data, further specific task focused data, a domain focused data, or a context specific data. You tune that model. Then finally, you start using that model, integrating with the existing applications through API or build a new application and then use that. So I think this is very important for organizations to understand. It's not like off the shelf models you are using. You also need to understand when those models, you take it as a basis on the top of that, you have to uh, tune them and make sure they work for your requirement. So this is called the life cycle. And in this uh, video, I'm not explaining again the same thing. So what I explained in the previous slide, out of all these things when you are doing data aggregation, architecture selection, tokenization, model training, model validation and all, most important thing is governance. That means whatever data you are taking, like Anil mentioned, whether are you breaching any IP, whether you are aligning with the regulatory, whether privacy issues are there, any bias issues are there, okay, license, IP, all those things you have to ensure a proper governance needs to be established. Otherwise, you will be in great trouble without knowing the provenance of the data, the origination of the data, and type of the data, whether it is uh, uh, legal or illegal, you will be in great trouble when you are training these models. So governance is very, very important. With that now, I'd like to just summarize here. As I said, based on the task or on a purpose or an objective, you need to select the word model, model architecture and a model, if you want to go and select the model, you just go to these marketplaces called Hugging Face, I think which has almost 4 lakh plus models available. They already make them tried with some data, which is available publicly. Then you take that as a basis and you start trying them with your own data, tune it with your own data and use it for your purpose. So there is subscription models are available to get these models. So Hugging Face, Vortex AI, Azure AI platform, Amazon SageMaker, OpenAI like ChatGPT, sorry, GPT-4 and all. So these things are sort of marketplaces when you want to have your custom built generative AI models, start here. Don't build it from ground, which is very, very difficult. I will show some uh, examples of how difficult it is to build your model from ground level. 
Okay, your choices. As per the Gartner, whether you want to buy or build your generative AI model, look at here, the extreme left side, you buy. You don't do anything yourself. You buy and use it. That's it. Okay. So that means the foundational model is coming off the shelf. Fine tuning is done. Data retrieval application and all. So that is extreme left. No differentiation. Not much of probably value. You come to the extreme right side, it is too much. You are building even the model. Taking some uh, whatever the algorithms I talk about, right? The generative adversarial networks or uh, the encoders. All those uh, algorithms, the brains which I spoke about, those models you take, you first start building the foundation model, you are fine tuning it, and all those things you do, everything yourself, you are not going to the marketplace and selecting it. So this is the build, which is very, very, very expensive. But some of the industries, you might end up doing that as per your requirement. If you look at in the middle, then if you look at the second column, okay, look at here. So you are only... I think APIs integration you are doing. Okay, you are not building anything. The third one, if you look at, you are basically using it and integrating with the application. Then fourth one, you are also fine tuning. Fifth one, you are doing everything yourself. So you have to be very clear, buy or a build or in between. What is that requirement you have? Which I think the pillar here best suit to you. You have to select. That's the way our technology department or our CIO organization has to align with business requirements and they have to start this journey, maybe initially buying and then slowly transition or you may stop at the third pillar level or if uh, based on your industry and then business requirements, if you want to go to the last one, which gives you a super duper differentiation and competitive advantage. All right, there are new roles required. Again, this is a key message for all of you if you are from the business and other different industries. It's not like with the existing software, guys, you can do it. There is a different a generative way architect and strategist is required, generative way engineer, generative way prompt engineer, generative way data scientist, generative way ethics and compliance, which is very, very important as a role. And then your content specialist, right? A generative way integration specialist, a lot of APIs are coming in, and generative way UX designer. I think you need to ask a question okay, am I ready to build my own generative way models? taking from marketplace or from ground, but do you have the team to do that? This is what I think you need to look at the skill development, all those things you have to plan for, okay? So I think, uh, all right, this, this is very important let's look at here, data management. So one of the very important aspect of generative AI, look at here, legal compliance, ethical, security and confidentiality, IP and risk management, conversational AI specific concepts. So you need to understand. Okay, let us look at chart GPT. This is built on top of GPT-4. Mostly it is used uh, the publicly available data. But we are not sure. May, they may claim. They may not be designed to completely compliant with general data production regulation. Or any other different countries have different regulatory um, policies are there. So if suppose those Things are not taken care when you are building your own generative AI models also, when you are a global service provider working with different countries and all, you have to ensure that you are very clear about the legal, ethical, security, confidentiality, IP, license, because data is the new oil. So data is the biggest asset. All these dimensions have been taken care. For this, you need the team, you need the governance to ensure these aspects are continuously monitored continuously checked. Let us say you built a model, but after three months, there is a new policy has come. But if you don't align your model and train it with the new policy, then you are in problem, right? So those things need to be looked at. Okay, so look at here. So for example, legal compliance, you have to look at the data sets comply with the laws like GDPR, CCPA and all. And licensing, sometimes you are using the data, but if you, you are breaching the license, and if you are not using the data from the reputable resources, then you will be in trouble. Then you need to also ensure that you define the guidelines, policies, frameworks. You are ethically right and responsibly you are using the AI so that it is not trained with the long, the wrong data. Suppose today, for example, if I ask a question in chat GPT, something on violence or a crime or a sex, it will say, sorry, I cannot give you that. 
that means it is trained it is trying to be responsible it is trying to be ethical right and also you need to look at, at comply with the specific uh, regional laws next one is uh, the stakeholders perspective you have to ensure that you need to form a legal experts and uh, ethicists to ensure that the data sets are proper it is transparent and uh, data sets are diverse and it doesn't have any biases i am sure you know couple of years back when uh, google tried when uh, an afro american image is put in it is giving an output which is very provoking and uh, uh, something insult so that means you have to really look at there is uh, the these models are tried they are not demonstrating bias in terms of the skin or a creed or a caste or a religion whatever right so you have to be very careful then you need to have a continuous improvement and feedback mechanisms so how your organization is getting ready for this this is second important element the third important element uh, if you uh, look at here the security and confidentiality you must have a proper very strict access controls right so the data is the asset the data is very very important thing so what is that access controls the wrong data is not used and the right data is not misused not misused the sensitive data is properly safeguarded and all so you might have to have um, anonymize the sensitive data and then you ensure that the development environments are secure and if any data is gone so loss prevention tools have to be incorporated then you have to ensure the vendors the contractual agreements and everything have to be properly managed then ip regularly audit data sets ip issues okay the intellectual property issues should not be there and you cannot generate exact verbatim output of the protected content something is somewhere is there okay your your uh, model is trained and giving in its own language that's fine but it cannot simply copy and give the exact verbatim so you have to ensure those things are also checked okay then <clears throat> give proper credit as required by data set licenses very important and conduct frequent risk assessments right so the i think last part here the conversational things ensure users know when interacting with the ai and provide accurate information don't give sensitive information unless you believe and trust that models right then you also fix the accountability if suppose whatever the model you built and if it is giving proper errors it is not giving the right outputs then who is responsible and accountable for that then you also need to look at these type of tools will create sometimes a lot of unrest maybe because some jobs may go so the balance between automation with human roles have to be clear and also don't depend too much on these things right moral and ethical sensitivity cultural so there are so many tools are available open source and commercial tools for you to implement all these things what i mentioned legal compliance ethical ai you cannot do it manually doing all these things is called governance so define the governance automate the governance activities ensure you are safe and ethical and responsible okay so what else uh, okay finally let us come to this cost it is very huge cost i mean of course this is a us numbers but don't worry about it but still so when you are using the generative ai you can subscribe to a model and you can license it and pay as you go and you can uh, add additional fee okay for example you look at microsoft 365 copilot they give it okay they might you might they might ask you to pay some additional money and api subscriptions you can do so a lot of different things are there but trust me building these models involves a good financial modeling budget estimation new roles new skills new infrastructure and i will show you one slide which is very very alarming that means it is a passionately you might say i want to build the generative ai uh, applications but how much computing power you require how much electricity is required how much carbon it is emitting those aspects will come into picture when you are really worried about environment and we are worried about ethics right so you have of course different models to build it subscriptions or add ons and if you want to fine tune from the marketplace if you want to take it from hugging face and all you have to pay subscription fee even to open ai Uh, subscription fee and use them okay there is no accurate data available but there are rumors and uh, i cannot uh, 
ensure that this data is right. Look at GPT-4 from OpenAI. They approximately used 25,000 NVIDIA A100 GPUs, 25,000 GPUs. And they took 90 to 100 days to train it. They used 3,125 servers and they have 1.7 trillion parameters. That means when you start learning, if you are a student, you take the notes, right? When you're reading a book, that is called a parameter. If suppose in the last uh, whatever, my 50 plus years uh, starting from uh, kindergarten to today, what I am learning, every learning element is a parameter. Now, GPT-4 has 1.7 trillion parameters. That means the learning elements. Then the electricity consumption, look at here for GPT-4, I think 62 crores, 31 lakhs, 8,750 kilowatts. And token limits, this token limit is nothing but if you go to BARD at a particular length, it will say, I am sorry, I am out. So the tokens are defined in such a way to what extent you can ask the question or a prompt. The tokens will decide the length of the prompt, what you can do. Okay. So you imagine, of course, we are not going to build uh, uh, any models like GPT-4, but certainly I can use the GPT-4 as a basis, which is already tried. On the top of that, I will use my own data sets, which are relating to a particular task or a domain, trying the GPT-4 so that the GPT-4 base knowledge is there. On the top of that, my specific knowledge data sets are available. In that way, I can differentiate it. So in my view, the wiser way is use the marketplaces, take the existing generative AI models and fine tune them so that you can reduce a lot of cost. You want to build from ground, very expensive because the computing, the electricity, they're all too expensive. Look at that. Okay, the last part of my session is everybody's talking about prompt and prompt engineering. So because if you want to be successful in the generative AI era, if you don't ask the right questions, it will not give you the right answers. Garbage in, garbage out. That's where they call it as, if you ask any generative AI tool, that is called a prompt. So how you become proficient in this prompt or a prompt engineering is very, very critical. Based on my experience, look at here, the prompt engineering is the skill of crafting questions. It is a skill of crafting questions or statements to guide the AI models in producing useful and relevant responses. It mixes creativity. You must have some creativity. You must have some technical know-how and it is vital for you because if you are not able to master in prompt engineering or how to create a prompt, very difficult for you to get best out of these generative AI tools. Whatever great generative AI tools you have, if your ability to prompt is not good, no use. That's why you have to train your people how to use and how to use the prompts and all. I have come up with my own. I mean, in the last one year, I have been extensively using few tools. Based on that, I gave a syntax for the book. I mean, it is not something uh, uh, right or wrong you can challenge. If you are using, let us say, BARD or Chart GPT or any other text focused large language models, then what is the purpose you have to put it first? And what is the context? Whether the context is customer interaction or mentoring employee or negotiating with partner or whether what is the market or geography and all, then role, in which role? Okay, I am a marketing consultant or I am a chief digital officer. You please write the response as if I am, you are the chief digital officer. That means you are asking this generative AI tool, play my role. Then you have to give the instruction or you have to ask it what you are looking for. Hey, I'm looking for market plan. I'm looking for business model. I'm looking for a website layout. I'm looking for a social media content or keywords for SEO. So you are basically giving an instruction. Then you have to mention whom you want this, whether it is age or a gender or religion or a target, basically. Then you have to ask in which format you want the response what generative AI tool is giving whether in the table format or a paragraph or a numbered or bulleted or indented, or it's like a narrative or it is a dialogue or it is a script. In fact, I tried to create some movie scripts also from this, you know, okay. Uh, plan any strategy, something like that. Then what is the tone you want? You want a convincing tone? You want 
a polite tone or a warning tone or an angry tone or frustrated, then steps. Okay. Steps is like sometimes you might say, hey, don't uh, go completely generate everything. You pause and ask me whether you want me to continue and all. You are just making sure whatever it generated is right or wrong. You want to verify. If it is crap, then you say just exit. Otherwise, you continue. Then boundary. You set the boundaries. Okay, I want two examples. I want uh, something like uh, not more than 200 words. I just want two ideas. This is the boundary. Then if you want to give some reference, you can also give the reference to uh, for that to understand. Right? Okay, this is what the text prompt I have given. And you know one thing? Using this, using chart GPT, I generated the prompt. Give the prompt to chat GPT, I generated a prompt based on my syntax. Then by combining this, I got this particular prompt. Okay, you may ask why this much length and all. Yes, I want a very clear outcome. Then based on the syntax here, look at here, this is the prompt. Create a marketing strategy for a new eco-friendly clothing line focusing on customer interaction within the fashion industry. And emphasizing sustainability and ethical production, particularly in the European market. Assume the role of marketing consultant and develop detailed plan that encompasses both online and offline marketing strategies, etc. etc. Look at here. This is a very detailed. You if you take this now and put it in chart GPT or a bar, it gives you fantastic output. So prompt engineering, you need a syntax. Okay, if you ask me whether this syntax is right, wrong, and all, I don't care. This is what I use it. I mean, I, it's not like I use it exactly purpose, context, role and all. When you are typing, based on your experience and usage, automatically all these things will come. You have to practice it, right? But when you go to the image, this prompt syntax is slightly different. Video prompt syntax might be different. Another example I have given, the image prompt syntax. Let us say dial E, for example, right? Background, location, day, night, firelight fire or sunset, sunrise, rainy season, gender, age, that is a context. Then mood, it's a happy mood, angry mood, excited, type of the image, whether you want a watercolor, a sculpture, or a digital art, or oil painting. Then framing, landscape, or portrait, or close-up. And uh, the color, saturated or muted, result. You want an abstract, you want cartoonish, or photorealistic, okay? What I did, I took this syntax from the left side. I asked the chart GPT, hey, based on this, you give me a real-life prompt based on my syntax. Then the right side, right side prompt is given by it. So using this prompt, that's the last one I will show you. How only last example I'll show and then we'll close it. Look at here. Um, I hope you are able to see the screen, everyone. No. No. Give me one minute. We'll close it. You're able to see this? Yeah? Yes, now it's visible. Okay, I'm using Dal E, for example. Look at here. I'm going to use this DALI. This is an excellent uh, from OpenAI. It generates uh, beautiful images. So I'm whatever the prompt I showed you there, based on my syntax. In fact, this prompt is also generated by this chat GPT, by the way. I just gave my syntax and asked it, give me an example prompt based on my syntax, it generated. So that means to generate the prompts, you can also take the help of these tools actually. But use the syntax so that it will. So let us see what it will generate. This is a DALI. And I just gave this prompt what it will generate. Let us see. But is it too much of a content? I'm sorry, I have to run <laughs> so a bit faster. But I try to cover the whole 360 degree view of generative AI, not limiting to just uh, uh, very simple things. You have to really consider so many things, actually, if you want to build this engine in our organization. No, I think uh, uh, VSR, while you were giving your session, I was reading all the comments and uh, from people, I think, um, you know, our attendees have found it very, very useful. And, uh, you know, they're saying we need more of you. Uh, 
you know very informative session so a lot of good compliments so uh, congratulations vsr i think it's been a Thank really you. great uh, session at, yeah look at here i mean still so that prompt image i want right so there is a girl and then there is a nature and whatever the prompt i have given this generated in a image here i can say i want an indian uh, attire girl then automatically it will change that so a lot of things you can change nowadays i think the images are coming perfect actually okay and you can also generate uh, videos okay i'll close anyhow in the interest of the time maybe next session we can have uh, five six tools how people can use them probably that could be a session today it's more of theoretical in the interest of the time so how you can generate videos from the text how we can have voice over so how we can but of course somebody from manufacturing industry if anybody using autodesk and all we can also ask them to show how they are using generative ai to come up with uh, new uh, de designs models right all those thank you so much friends i think that's it uh, from my side today yeah um thanks vs sir um i think it's been a great session as i just told you and uh, you know while you were talking people have given a lot of uh, compliments they're in fact looking forward to your next session so uh, so so glad i thanks i think we'll be back again soon with um, you know more of vsr and talking about other aspects uh, but yeah although we are short of time but i think we can still uh, you know uh, ask vsr request vsr to answer a few questions that uh, you know you have asked so uh, vsr let me just get on with some other questions um yeah. i think there are you know while you you gave some examples of uh, dali and how you can create images and the prompt engineering aspect of it but i think there are some questions that are specifically related to using um, you know uh, gen ai for different verticals so somebody said can you use it for supply chain and logistics for instance so so yeah. there is a question around that maybe you can give an answer on that um you know and uh, of course there are further questions but maybe you can start off answering by answering that question and then we'll move into the others see more and more uh, whatever this uh, generative ai models are given by these biggies like google or uh, uh, open ai and all they are generic for example uh, but if you want to make them more specific to your industry for example so one of the district collectors spoke to me uh, he was he was uh, just, so, sorry to interrupt you once uh, vsr i think uh, some people have some uh, busy meetings and also i'll just tell them a couple of things first one is that this webinar will be available on demand a lot of people have asked for it that they want to have it on demand um number two when you do exit if 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 you want to you know i i'm seeing a lot of people there you you can you know listen in on the q and a but in case you have to leave um you know there's a feedback form that will pop up once you leave so do answer that uh, you know give us the feedback uh, tell us what more you want to know and we'll definitely come back and we'll request vsr to take some more sessions around it as well so uh, you know so that uh, just wanted to make that short announcement so vsr i'm sorry back to you yeah no problem so i think that's where i mentioned if you want to make it for a particular function domain context and all you have to take your own data sets take that base from the marketplaces and you have to choose the right generative ai model which is suitable for and a lot of descriptions are there like api catalog you also have now this generative ai models catalog is there hugging face and all then take that and take your data set and clean it and train this particular model with your data set then automatically it will become very specific to your domain and a very specific to your function by the way google i am sure is going to beat the market with uh, vertical focused generative ai tools uh, they are already coming up with the form to medical it is exclusively for healthcare industry and they are training their model on healthcare data imagine how they are going to revolutionize the whole healthcare industry with that form to medical like that you have to build your own customized fine tuned generative ai models uh, for a specific to industry so uh, now somebody wants to know how do you really explain gen ai in layman terms with an example that you know they want to mention that they are using a product that is running with gen ai in the background so how do you really mention that in an easy way uh, you know let's say while you are doing a marketing you can say we are using gen ai for you know this particular product the gen ai for example if uh, it is trained it is trained with our own data set maybe with our own customer related information 
maybe through social media or maybe through your crm tool and all if gen ai model is integrated right with that particular crm tool i am sure i think uh, salesforce is einstein or something already they have such type of uh, things then what happens is if i am the customer and come to your crm tool same thing like chat gpt or uh, same thing like uh, bard there is a window coming up in the crm tool then customer will ask it is so highly personalized and it is exactly suiting to his requirement so that is the way the generative ai is generating the content generating the summaries generating the responses everything contextual and personalized to me because it is a trained as per the data sets given to that particular model based on the customer information it knows that you are that person then it will basically do that so it generates as per the context and the personalization required for that particular customer they don't visibly appear but the generative ai models are integrated with our traditional the erp or internet applications that's where the new trend now you cannot have just only the erp applications or next gen uh, extended enterprise applications the generative ai models apis are integrating with those type of systems through apis you are getting the power of generative ai models the apis are opened by these some of the generative ai model manufacturers our developers okay uh, so one common question i had from everyone was can they get a copy of your presentation uh, so uh, is it possible maybe we can share it with them after you've gone through it in case there is any ip related things you want to remove yes, them yes. and then we can share them yes. so yeah so we'll definitely share the ppt with you after the session and make it available on demand um uh, how reliable is the code generated by gpts see there is nothing reliable first you have to work that whatever first point the generative ai tools are not for novices not for youngsters not for the guys who doesn't have experience because they don't know how to validate whether the outcomes given by the generative ai tools are right or wrong if you have the ability to tell the outcome generated by the generative ai tools right or wrong then only use it if you don't know then you are you will be fooled because you are showing something wrong right so you you have to go with an assumption the generative ai tools will go wrong that means what you have to strengthen your review and you have to strengthen your monitoring mechanisms to ensure that whatever content or whatever outcome given by these tools are right there is that's why new roles are coming in now the content validators this is a new role not the content creators in the past you have the content creators but today content is generated by generative ai tools so why i need to have creators now but those creators have to be transformed to validators and reviewers once it is generated they have to check and say yes this is good go don't trust okay so i think um, um uh, although there are lots and lots of questions uh, i don't think we'll be able to cover all of it in a short period of time uh, so uh, maybe just pick up some random questions how can you train the module in gen ai maybe this is more specific on training a module module means what i mean uh, model or module uh, i says module but possibly it might be a model uh, just maybe a typo or something how can you train the model in gen ai see that's where i am telling you when i showed one slide you better go to market places first already somebody built the models for you using those brains which are the algorithms available they tried those models with a set of data available in the public and uh, probably they might have purchased some data and all it is half done for you okay don't build it from uh, ground which is very expensive because you saw that gpt4 of course we may not build gpt4 scale okay that is too huge okay but whatever you want to build first ensure that uh, a marketplace based on your task and purpose or requirement select which model is suitable for you pick it up understand and train your people uh, how to ensure that model is fine tuned this is a technical term how you fine tune the existing model with your data sets when you are taking the data sets whatever i mentioned the ethical ip license legal regulatory all those things you take care then try the model and then make it ready for your requirement i think that is a better way of what model you have to choose that's where the expertise required in your organization going to the marketplaces and then trying to see that for my requirement this particular model is the best fit you need to build that capability within our organization 
Okay, I think uh, uh, you know we'll now conclude the uh, webinar today. There is a lot of questions that we can do. Maybe is that you know we will share them with VSR and he can go through them and uh, you know maybe look at the answers. We'll send the answers to you individually and maybe also put them on our blog on uh, you know uh, C Change website, which is a part of uh, you know CMR uh, aimed at the you know C suite audience and answering all the questions. Number one. So I see a lot of questions, VSR, around uh, leveraging Genai for specific industries. So that supply chain was one example, but there's also examples for like industry 4.0, 5.0, manufacturing, you know, things like that. So maybe we can probably look at answering those uh, separately and uh, also look at if we can divide another have another session which has maybe some tools and demonstrate that and that we're getting from a lot of people. Yeah. So, um, so I think, yeah, I think we'd right. like yeah. to conclude the session today. Uh, thanks a lot to, uh, you know, VSR. Thanks, I think, for the terrific session. Uh, it's been really, really useful. And uh, thanks to all the attendees for uh, joining us today. And, um, you know, I'm, as I said, we'll make it available on, on demand. We'll <laughs> share the presentation, get a feedback form. Do fill that up as well, because you can be more specific in that. And we will try to evaluate that and see, you know, where the maximum requests are coming from and probably craft, a, uh, you know, a, 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 another session for you and come back to you later. So uh, thank you once again to uh, all the attendees and, uh, you know, see you again soon and have a, you know, great uh, evening. And, uh, thank you, you so said, much. Please send those questions. Uh, we will create a FAQ that will be useful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so we much. will do that. Okay, thank you. Bye -bye. All right. Bye-bye.